Okay, let us get started. <clears throat> okay, so um, we're reaching the end game here. Just a couple more topics to cover before we're done for the semester. Uh, and at this point, what we're going to do is talk about things other than CUDA. Starting today, uh, continuing on through a couple of guest lectures, and then one lecture at the end of the semester to wrap things up. Um, so let's talk logistically first, okay? So today, clearly, we're here together. Thursday, what we're going to do is we have a guest lecture from Ben Sander at AMD, who's going to be talking about AMD's alternative to CUDA, um, and that will be online, so we're not going to meet in person. And his lecture is actually going to be at 2 o'clock, so it won't be 9.30. Uh, we'll record it, so if you want to watch it afterwards, you're welcome to watch it afterwards. If you want to attend live, attend live. Um, but that's going to be Thursday, so no in-person meeting at all on Thursday. But the Zoom lecture at 2 o'clock uh, Central Time, okay? And that's all on the course syllabus, so you'll, you'll be able to see the link and you'll be able to join in if you want. So that's Thursday. Now, then we've got the break. The break is next week. Let me just put this up. Give me one second here. So what we're saying is uh, we are we're here today, November 15th. Ben is coming in to talk, or no, he's going to be online to talk uh, on Thursday. Uh, and Ben, by the way, just to give you a little context, Ben was like you. He was a, a student here, undergraduate student here and then a master's student here. Uh, this was in the mid-90s. And uh, uh, joined AMD after he graduated here with his master's degree. And he has been at AMD ever since in technical roles. And now he is at the very top, or maybe second to top technical role at AMD. So if the top technical role is CTO, and there's one at AMD, Ben is a group of, I think, 10 or 15 individuals that are called corporate fellows. So he rose quite high and, um, at, at AMD, and he's been there throughout his career. Um, he's done chip architecture uh, for many AMD uh, generations. And then I would say maybe, I don't know, eight years ago, he switched over to the software side, and he has been essentially building the uh, AMD equivalent of the CUDA tools at AMD. Great guy, very friendly, and uh, I think you'll enjoy hearing his perspective, okay? So then, uh, that again is Thursday. Don't come here, but join in online at two o'clock. Your sparse, multiple, sparse matrix multiply lab is due on Friday, and then we've got fall break. We'll have a guest lecture again uh, on the 25th, okay? And that's another online lecture, except it's during our lecture time, okay? If you like, I will come here anyways, all right? We can all hang out and we'll see James talk uh, on the big screen here, okay? And uh, J James and I kind of had a overlap. We were both students at University of Michigan um, a 
while ago. And James has always been, like Ben, always been at Intel. And his role is a very unique role. He's been, uh, like Ben, working on software tools at Intel, primarily on the parallel programming side. So James is gonna talk about, I think, I'm not quite sure yet, but Intel's equivalent to CUDA, um, which they call one API, um, and it primarily centers around something called SICL, which is um, system CL. Okay, so yeah, the course has been very heavy on CUDA, but we wanna make sure we look at the broad spectrum of things. So the last bit of the course is really about looking at what's out there, okay? And what's exciting is, it's not just NVIDIA, right? There's a lot of stuff happening here. In fact, I think acceleration, compute acceleration, is really the next big wave in architecture and chip innovation. So much so that I'm teaching a whole course on it. One of the very first university courses on this topic, so. Um, yeah, and that's it. After that, we'll have uh, a final lecture together, you and I, December 1st, and then we're done. Okay, any questions, comments? Well, good. So here's what we're gonna do today. Today is kind of a very broad survey, and I, I think today, don't get wrapped up in the details, because I'll tell you what, I'll confuse you, because I myself don't know all the details. There's so much here. It's a very, very big space. But rather, the way to approach this is to think, okay, I, I you, you, want to understand how we got here, okay? Why? Because you guys are plotting the future, right? You're gonna be part, you're gonna, you're, the next Ben Sander is here amongst you, okay? So well, if you wanna plot the future, you gotta kinda understand how we got here. That's really what today is about, to give you kind of that perspective, uh, because it's not just about CUDA. CUDA is the biggest thing out there, by the way, right? It's massive because of, uh, you know, almost 10 or 15 years worth of NVIDIA investment in this, but it's not the only thing. So, I mean, I think if I taught this course uh, five years ago, maybe not five years ago, maybe 10 years ago, it was a question, is this accelerated computing thing a fad or is it here to stay? It was a question, I don't think we, we knew. It was interesting, that was for sure. But now it's for sure, it's here to stay. Uh, you know, it's not just one vendor making um, chips that accelerate your code. It's pretty, pretty much anybody who's selling a chip that can be programmed that's selling an accelerator that can accelerate your code. And it's all the way from, you know, the Apple, the latest Apple chips be it you know, for the, the iPhone or for um, the iPad or for the, the Mac platform. They, they all have acceleration. They have GPUs, they have neural uh, accelerator cores. Clearly, NVIDIA cards can be, can be used as compute acceleration. You can buy servers now that have uh, NVIDIA cards or AMD cards or whatever, FPGAs all the way to supercomputers, like for example, the Blue Water supercomputer. So the hardware is there. And the question is, is there, how do we program these things, right? How do we write code in a manner like we did all semester long in this course? Question. It's been decommissioned and we're gonna talk about that. Okay, so let me hold that question off and uh, we will talk about Blue Water. Yeah. <laughs> I actually don't know. I don't know what they're doing with it. So, all right. That's the hardware. 
And what we should realize is, well, of course, the software has had a similar, no, I, wanna, I don't mean to say software. I mean the hardware software interface, the programming model, has had a very rich history alongside all of this compute acceleration. Right? We like to think about it as CUDA, which is the right starting point for us. But even before CUDA, there were these things, OpenGL, DirectX, that people used not to do compute acceleration per se, but to accelerate 3D graphics, which were probably the highest um, compute requirement thing that many, many people needed. Okay, so it stood that, yeah, we need silicon to accelerate that workload. And if there's gonna be silicon to accelerate that workload, we gotta be able to program that silicon to do the things we wanna do. So these software APIs, this hardware software interface, were created in the mid 90s, early in the mid 90s. OpenGL still around, right? If you're, if you're a graphics person, you might have used OpenGL. Uh, DirectX, I, mean, I don't know that it's still that popular. I'm not a Windows programmer, so I don't know. I don't know if that's really what Windows uses these days, but it was the proprietary equivalent to the open standard OpenGL. Now, early 2000s, these graphics cards were getting so general purpose that groups of students actually, like yourselves, were saying, hey, we could use these compute engines or, or these graphics engines to kind of speed up these things that are taking a long time for compute, like matrix multiplying. So people started taking OpenGL and kind of shoehorning it to do things like matrix multiplying. In fact, I had a project right around 2002 where uh, I was working with Todd Martinez in the physics department. He's no longer here. Um, who was a quantum physicist and this undergraduate student where we got a bunch of PlayStation 1s. Yeah, it was PlayStation 1s, I think. Jeez. Maybe PlayStation 2s, I can't remember now. And we connected them up into a cluster to do quantum physics calculations. It was the coolest project. And this was uh, 2000, you know, probably 2001 or 2002, I can't remember now. Um, and that was the early days, right? We were trying to do something because all this hardware was super cheap. So instead of you know, using a $100 million supercomputer, we were doing you know, 32-bit floating point on these gaming consoles because they had way more computing power than any PC, and they were cheaper, right? They were $200. You couldn't buy a $200 PC back then. So that was the birth, I think, of this you know, large scale, very cheap, accelerated computing movement. It got so big that uh, in 2007, NVIDIA said, well, you know what? We're gonna make it a commercial thing. <coughs> We're gonna invest around a software interface that you know, real software vendors can invest around and we're gonna commit to it. 2007 saw the origination of CUDA. Then of course, this started to grow. OpenCL came about in 2008, which was kind of the open standard equivalent of CUDA. In fact, we're gonna talk about OpenCL today. It's gonna be one of the things we look at. And from there, kind of we're seeing this explosion of different things that ultimately accomplish the same thing. You've got some code, you wanna accelerate pieces of that code. You don't necessarily wanna rewrite the code in a new language, but using you know, C, 
Fortran, maybe even Python. Can you take that code and somehow accelerate it to take advantage of uh, these uh, new pieces of silicon? Okay. And now it's gone so far that you could be using Python, or you could be using TensorFlow, or you could be using some other thing and not even realize that what's happening is this thing you're doing is actually programming and using the GPU. Okay, so it's become kind of almost that commonplace. So that's the history of it, okay. So what we're gonna, we can't, there's no way we're gonna spend any time looking at all of these things. So what we chose to do is kind of look at three samples. And of course, the AMD guy and the Intel guy are gonna talk about their own thing. But today, what we're gonna do is kind of look at three samples in this space, in this hardware software interface space. Uh, one is OpenCL, which is the clear analog to NVIDIA's CUDA. Right? In fact, they kind of grew up together. And for a long time, whatever would appear in NVIDIA's latest CUDA version, six months later, eight months later, would appear in the OpenCL standard. Right? That's kind of how these things happen. Okay, but it was an open standard, meaning multiple companies like AMD, Apple, uh, Intel, Qualcomm, could all invest in them because it wasn't dominated and closed like NVIDIA CUDA. Okay, so we'll take a look at that. Um, there's a more scientific approach driven by the high-performance computing community, the scientific com computing community called OpenACC. I don't know that it's widely popular, but it's interesting. It's a low-code approach. I call it a low-code approach because ideally you take your Fortran code or your C, C++ code, and you kind of sprinkle it with a few things, far less than you have to do with CUDA, and the tools would take over for you. Okay, so it's a, what a, you know, start with your sequential code, sprinkle it with some stuff, and then all of a sudden it runs magically on the, uh, the accelerated hardware. That's the open CC, ACC approach. Now, coming back to Blue Waters, the last thing we'll look at is what if we had a Blue Waters-like supercomputer and it turns out that accelerated computing plays a significant role in a supercomputer. So you can't escape it, right? There's no, well, if I spend $100 million, I'm gonna get something far better than an NVIDIA GPU. <laughs> it turns out that these NVIDIA GPUs are also, and AMD GPUs, are also at the ultra high end. So, well, how do I make use of those? And we're gonna talk about open, it, sorry, MPI which is almost the de facto standard for these very large scale uh, uh, ultra systems, okay? And now we're gonna do that in about an hour. So there's a lot of details here that I'm, I'm just not gonna dwell on. Big, broad strokes, okay? Now, if we're taking a look at this uh, compute accelerated uh, hardware, like NVIDIA's GPUs or AMD's GPUs or Apple's GPUs, Qualcomm's GPUs, there's, there's a, a common set of things just because that makes the most sense. Like you're not gonna do it differently because you're gonna give something up and your GPUs aren't gonna be as good as your competitors' GPUs. Hierarchy of lightweight cores. Uh, yeah, of course. These cores are not CPU cores. They're far, far smaller. We use the word lightweight. They can't do some things. Right? What can't they do? Let's talk about that. It's worth talking about. I have a CPU core. I have a, the equivalent of an NVIDIA GPU core, which is, what is that? What is that core? What we, what's the equivalent there? 
you know. Good. So let's pause there. Let me let me back up one step, just so that we're all thinking in the right level. Let's consider a CPU core, something that runs a CPU thread. Right? You know what a CPU thread is, right? Right. Now we'll consider a GPU core, something that runs a GPU thread. How are they different? What can I do in a CPU thread that I can't do in a GPU thread? Yeah. There's a lot of system stuff that I'm not doing on the, C on the GPU. Awesome. Let's get rid of all that garbage. Because I, that stuff takes a lot of transistors. Like what? What, what do we mean by system stuff? Yeah. Reading from the network. Device. D d yeah, so managing devices. I'm not trying to do that on a GPU, so I don't need a th GPU thread to do any of that. Right? Managing devices interrupts. Right? I I've got you thinking along the right terms. Okay? So all that stuff, virtualization, uh, interrupts, uh, uh, lots of exceptions. Uh, all this stuff that, yeah, in order for me to run the core thread on my self-driving car, yeah, I gotta have that stuff, but I don't need it on these lightweight cores. Question? Um, could you just help? Even that, okay, that's a great point. So things that you and I might wanna do from a programming perspective, recursion as an example. Early versions of CUDA did not support recursive threads. I still think they don't do that well because well, you're not going to do recursion, right? I think programmatically, it has to be there. But it's not something that will work very well. So it turns out that, yeah, for most things we do, the code I write in C or C++, I can do it on a GPU thread. I can't run a Linux kernel on a GPU thread because I never will. Okay, now dot 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 right. And all the rest of this stuff follows. We're going to see commonality across the hardware from all these vendors. That's the perspective they take. So if I've got all that stuff, commonality in like the local scratch pads, lack of hardware coherence. If I've got so many threads, forget about hardware coherence. It's just not going to happen. Slow atomics, the threading model that I just told you about. So what we see in the software, be it um, CUDA or OpenCL or some of these other things, is discrete memory spaces. I've got device memory, I've got host memory. They're not common. There's no singular address space. Okay. There are some programming models now that are trying to create a singular address space, but that comes at a cost. Okay. By and large, I've got to copy data from one place to another. And when I copy, all my pointers are different. So if I've got a pointer data structure, it's wrong if I copy it over into the, into the CUDA memory, device memory. And then things like grids and blocks and threads that kind of hierarchy, because I've got a hierarchy of cores, I'm going to see a hierarchy imposed in the software model. And then by and large, they use this idea called bulk synchronous parallelism, which maybe you've never heard of that before, and that's fine. It turns out you've been using it all semester long. And the idea of bulk synchronous parallelism is that I've got a kernel. Kernel has a bunch of threads in, in, the, in the CUDA world. Those threads all do the same thing. And they only differ by their thread ID and block ID. Then I've got another 
kernel, and I've got another kernel, and by and large, that second kernel can't start until the first kernel's done. That's called bulk synchronous. I've got a bunch of threads, hundreds of thousands of threads. They all must finish before the next kernel starts. That's all that means. Okay. So let's take a look at OpenCL. All right. So again, I think I've gone through the um, the history of it, but I'll briefly say a few things. Uh, it kind of launched uh, based on a consortium uh, that included NVIDIA. So it wasn't done. You know, kind of, okay, NVIDIA, you're over there. You don't you don't get to talk to us. NVIDIA actually had a part in this. It's funny because. This all happened right after the AGEA acquisition. This AGEA was the company um, that I was part of. Uh, right after the AGEA acquisition by NVIDIA. And my team, my architecture team, was part of this. And the guy who was NVIDIA's representative on OpenCL was a student of mine. He was like, again, yeah, one of you. Um, he is now the vice president of CUDA at NVIDIA, uh, but back in 2008, he was NVIDIA's representative on OpenCL. So how do you think that went, right? You know, here's NVIDIA investing heavily on CUDA, all these other guys, they want to do OpenCL. I always thought, you know, what would, what would NVIDIA's position be? Do they want to slow it down? Do they want to speed it up? Uh, but anyway. OpenCL launched in 2008. Um, you know, roughly 10 years later, still going strong with 2.2. 2018, 10 years later, Apple announces no more OpenCL. Um, and that kind of, I think, really changed things from an OpenCL perspective. Because you couldn't now expect, I mean, what's the benefit of OpenCL? It runs on anything. It runs on all this hardware from all these companies. And you write your code once, and you can use it across all these things. And then Apple does this. And all of a sudden, oh, that thing that was such the big advantage is no longer the big advantage. And phew, I think it just kind of sent it spiraling. Um, and, and, but we're seeing kind of Intel and AMD pick up the pieces to really try to fill in the gap. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the, the technical details. All right, we're gonna see in the details of OpenCL, again, given its history, kind of a mirroring of what happens with CUDA. So the model, and by the way, in fact, the concepts are very much similar, but the names are different. Grids are not called grids. Uh, they're called work groups. Um, or, no, contexts, yeah, contexts. And blocks are called work groups. And work items are called threads. And so there's a, there's a changing of terminology, but the concepts are similar. OK. And you can see. Uh, in OpenCL, you've got this idea of private memory that's private to a work group, just like we have shared memory that's private to a block. Okay, and then so on and so forth. Actually, no, private memory corresponds to th per thread memory. And then local memory corresponds to uh, shared memory in a, in, a, in a block. Okay, so... Taking a look at matrix multiply from the perspective of OpenCL. Again, the idea here is not to dwell on the details. There's a lot of stuff here. Like if you wanted to write OpenCL code, you're all very, I think at this point, once you understand the terminology, very capable of doing that. Okay. I mean, the code you recognize, right? Because it looks very similar to our CUDA code. We've got the kernel designation as opposed to the global designation. Uh, 
my GMM2. Uh, we've got the input parameters, which we describe using C notation. We've got local variables, uh, which again are like shared. And we've got things where we can get the thread ID um, in various dimensions. So right up here, so I can get my thread ID and I can get my group ID. And we've got the various dimensions, dimension zero, dimension one, dimension one, zero, so on and so forth. So given that we're very familiar with uh, the CUDA version of this, this looks very analogous, right? What I'm not showing here is the host code. And the host code is a little more complicated because they use this idea of context, like, uh, which is roughly equivalent to a CUDA stream. Okay, so what I can do is, uh, create a queue, put some commands in that queue in the context. I can do some mem copies, memory allocations. Those things are all there on the host code, but they use this idea of a context to manage it all. Okay. And we even see things like uh, sync threads here in the context of uh, the OpenCL barrier. Okay, question. That is a nightmare. Yes, because what we have to, you're right. So what his point is, hey, uh, we took this code, we really optimized it for the particular GPU we're running on, right? We know what the resources are, we know how many, you know, what the uh, number of threads per block and the SMs and da 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 da, right? It's all very dependent on the specifics of the hardware. So, well, now if I'm trying to do this to run on AMD GPUs and NVIDIA GPUs, how do you do that? So lots of if defs or lots of you know device queries to figure out what works well. And then your code just looks awful. And that's been one of the big shortcomings of OpenCL. Because that human mapping, right? The programmer has to do that mapping and then either create some sophisticated make files that use different sources or pre-process those, right? It just gets messy. Um, but that's what you have to do. Okay. Any questions? We're going to move on to OpenACC. Yeah. Um, that, that, I mean, that particular one's an interesting one uh, because I don't know that there is a consensus. You know, everybody tries to outdo each other because, it, to some degree, that's a hidden parameter. Okay, so let's take warp size off the table, but other things, yes. You know, so I, I think that in the early days there was a lot of let's follow Nvidia's lead. Nvidia would decide. Uh, you know, uh, our shared memory size is going to be this. And the other ones would follow because that just is what made sense. All right, I got to mute notifications here. Okay. Uh, okay, so moving on. Any other OpenCL questions? Okay, let's take a look at a very different approach. In fact, maybe even to address uh, your question. 
how do I make coding easier, given that there's such a big variety of these things? Okay, so in spirit, I think that's what OpenCC, OpenACC tried to accomplish, which is, okay, write your code once, and then annotate it with a few things so that the compiler or the tools can take over from there. Okay, so the idea here is, let's start with the code that we'd like to write, Fortran, C, C++, because in this world, that's what people like to use. All right, and then let's sprinkle it with these things called pragmas. So what we'll do is, the programmer will insert these pragmas. Uh, so no APIs, right? We're going to have minimal APIs. But these pragmas will be inserted to identify the loops that will get accelerated. Because, I mean, if there's no loop, there's no parallelism. Uh, it's bottom line, right? There, if there's no iteration. Where, where, where is the parallelism? So there's got to be some loop someplace, some iteration someplace, that we can turn into a massively parallel set of threads. So the compiler will let the programmer identify those areas and then take over from a code manipulation perspective. Okay. See how it works. Um, again, the model, very much the same. Discrete memories, got to copy things over, and the two devices, the host and the device, are essentially different programming beasts, things that have to be programmed differently. Okay, so let's take a look at matrix multiply in OpenACC. So what we're going to do is we're going to write the sequential code, as we would normally, right? That's the sequential code right there. Good, because that starting point we would have to do anyways, We've got to do that. Now, unfortunately, in the general case, it's a little difficult for a compiler to unwind everything and discover the parallelism on its own. It has a lot to do with the fact that memory tends to be ambiguous to the compiler because it's just, it's indexed, you know? So it's because we're doing it indirectly, we don't know where the, where the dependencies really are. So what we'll do is have the programmer insert a few things. Like let's put that pragma in there, pound pragma. If you're not familiar with pragma, it's kind of like a pound define, right? It's just something that directs the compilation process to do something differently with your code, which by the way, could be ignored. I can ignore that and my code still works just fine, right? That's the whole idea. Now that pragma has a bunch of stuff in it and we'll go through and we'll pick it apart just to give you a flavor of what's in that stuff, okay? And in this case, you gotta throw in another pragma, but we'll get to it. Actually, let's pick it apart. So I've got pragma ACC, right? That's an ACC pragma. Open ACC pragma. That's what that means. Pragma is a generic concept. It's not an open ACC concept. It, there are compilers that use pragmas uh, for all kinds of things. Okay. Now, all the rest of the stuff after the ACC corresponds to open ACC directives. For example, copy in, copy in, copy out. At this point, you know exactly what those do. Of course, right? I've got a host, I've got a device, host memory, device memory, host memory, to device memory, M, host memory, to device memory, N. And at the end of all of this process, take the result P and copy it back to the host. Right? Now, if I wanted to ignore it, because all of this stuff is running on the CPU, fine, everything works. But if P and M and N are 
going to be running on different discrete devices with different memories, well, make sure you do the copies. Okay, so again, you can easily see how this doesn't apply to every single situation, but it's okay. Maybe it applies to 90% of the situations, which is great. Okay, so then what I need is I need some way to describe thread blocks and threads. And that's what we're going to see with these parallel constructs, loop, and there's going to be another one we're going to introduce. Okay. <coughs> um, so that's how it works. Now, some of the issues that we run into with OpenACC is, is these pragmas are hints. That's what they are. And OpenACC, as a result, isn't going to find everything. It's not going to optimize your code as if you were to have written it in CUDA, which, where everything is explicit, completely controlled by you. Um, you know, kind of the, the, I think somebody asked, very early in the semester, why are we doing all this stuff by hand? You know, isn't, can't the compiler take my code and convert it into CUDA? And that's a very legitimate question, by the way. I, th I think, I feel embarrassed that the answer isn't, well, of course the compiler can. You know, it's not there yet. It hasn't been there, uh, and it may not get there for quite a while, that process. But you can appreciate that open ACC is kind of a way for us to get to that point. Okay. So yes, writing everything by hand explicitly still has an advantage, but open ACC can get a big part of the advantage quickly without a lot of effort on our part. Right, that's the point. Okay, just quickly, let's kind of go through this. Uh, the OpenACC model is, um, you know, we've got threads, we've got execution units, and correspondingly, what we're going to introduce, surprise, surprise, is this idea of a gang, red block, and worker, red. This hierarchy, two-level hierarchy, where things proceed in a bulk synchronous way. So again, those elements of CUDA appearing naturally with an open, open ACC. Okay, so we launch a bunch of gangs, I love that word, uh, that have a bunch of workers that do a bunch of operations and then everything comes back together. Okay, um, some details, I don't know if this is worth going through. Gangs and loops, fine. That's, it's here in the slides. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I just don't know that I'm going to do it justice by going through it. Okay, the important bits are there. Any questions on OpenACC? Yeah? Um, can you explain that? I mean, the interesting thing is, no. They try to abstract that away. You know, let me say this. I don't know what the latest versions of OpenACC have because it's an evolving spec. Maybe there's some uh, private memory management in, in, in the latest specs, but in the specs from, I don't know, a few years ago, no. You, you kind of don't want to, you want to abstract that away from the programmer. And furthermore, we don't want to taint our original code. Right, so... It's a little difficult to do. Question? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Why would the compiler take two copies? Why does it ever have to? Yeah, you're right. I mean, if, if oh, yeah, so the, the elegance of OpenACC is that there is a, always a path to correct execution. Right? There's always a reference 
code there if you remove all the pragmas. Um, so you're not going to create a parallel execution that's incorrect. Because if the compiler can't generate the correct parallel execution, it'll just fall back to doing nothing. Right? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, how does the uh, compiler or ACC library validity check for like what's happening inside the pragma? So does it run like a toy program? To how does it know? It knows that you're guaranteed to have a correct solution, but how do you know that the ACC generated solution is the same? So that is a excellent question. Um, what, what I don't know how the Open ACC compiler works, or the compilers. There's you know multiple of them, um, but, but historically, you have to take a conservative approach. You have to generate provably correct code. And if it's provably correct, then you generate the code. Now, what that means is, yeah, there's going to be a, uh, some situations where you just don't know that, yeah, I could have run these two. You know, the programmer said do A, then B, and then uh, you did some analysis, and you said, well, I know for a fact, provably, I can run A and B concurrently. Okay, great. So now you run them as parallel threads. More often than not, what happens is you don't know for a fact that you can run A and B concurrently, right? Because there's some reference that you're not sure is independent, okay? If you're not sure, then you can't because you don't know that they're independent. In which case, the OpenACC compiler has to pick the conservative path, right? So that's a situation where you might be leaving performance on the table. Now, as a programmer, you would know. So if you're writing CUDA, you would say, fine, this is parallel. Make sense? That's just part of the trade-off here. OK. Any open ACC questions? Let's talk about the far extreme case. Um, and what I did here is I essentially uh, listed the top five supercomputers uh, from the top 500 list. This is from this morning, so this is, you know, latest and greatest. Now, you should have no illusion that these are the top five supercomputers in the world. These are the top five supercomputers that we know about in the world. And I'm very honest about that. I think it's very true that there are, there are systems out there that we just don't know about that are going to be you know, potentially more powerful, powerful than this. That's fine. Just a question of how much money you want to spend, right? And if you've got money to spend, you can build as powerful system as you want. So that there's a commonality across all five. That is worth mentioning. Okay. And this was not true 15 years ago, but it's true now. If you look at the specs, the descriptions here of the system, Frontier, number one, uh, it's a system that's at Oak Ridge <laughs> National Laboratory, has an AMD optimized third generation EPIC two gigahertz core, whatever that means. I, I don't even pay attention to those things. It's got an AMD Instinct M1 blah, blah, blah GPU. Next one. Uh, actually, that one doesn't, doesn't say it, it has a GPU on it, but it does. Uh, third one, AMD core, AMD GPU. Intel Core, NVIDIA GPU. Uh, yeah. Of course. Are you okay? You want to move? You're welcome to move.
Are you okay? You can move. We can take a break. It's okay. You know, can you have whatever reaction you want? Are you are you okay, everyone? I am fine. Okay. Let's, are you okay? <laughs> let's try to carry on. It's a cockroach up here. Uh, okay. Where was I? Uh, yeah, in, uh, Nvidia GPU, Intel Core, IBM uh, uh, CPU, Nvidia GPU. What's the point? The point is, now when we talk about supercomputing, you can't escape GPUs. They're not, you know, PlayStation 2 toys anymore. These are real things that are part and parcel, part of high performance computing these days. That's a good question. Why don't we try to answer that once we put all the pieces together here? Okay, that's a great question. Now, in part, let's look at this diagram, right? This is a diagram from the uh, uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory Frontier Supercomputer, number one on the list. This is one node. There's 9,472 9, nodes on this thing. And what we have is one AMD EPIC CPU, which obviously has more cores on it, right? It's not just a single core machine, with four GPUs. So even if these cores were doing, if, you know, were doing things, well, I've got four times as many GPUs as I have one of those things, right? You can see the numbers. Staggering. This was not the case 15 years ago. Um, let me talk about Blue Waters now. 2013 is when this thing was commissioned, or, or when it was uh, first operational. The first version of this, when it was designed, had no GPUs. It was designed at the point where NVIDIA GPUs were starting to become a thing. So they kind of retrofitted it, created a second version, before they launched it, that introduced GPUs uh, into the architecture. Okay, so yeah, I don't know if you're familiar with Blue Water, but it's a computer that was one of the fastest at the time, and it was just at, you know, down the street here at the uh, 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 supercomputer center by the research park. That whole building was built for Blue Water waters okay uh, yeah it'd be cool if you can you know grab a piece of, uh, of blue waters I remember when I was a student uh, considering coming to Illinois for graduate school I came here for a campus visit and I was very impressed with the cray system that they had and in my day the cray was this really cool looking supercomputer that uh, was you know kind of almost crescent-shaped. Um, and it was actually in a building right off Springfield here. Um, I don't know what the building is called anymore, but that's where it was. And you can go in and you can look at it, and it was just very impressive. Um, so anyway, Blue Water. The Blue Water node, after its revision, uh, included an NVIDIA Tesla GPU, or no, Kepler GPU. And I think this node, there are a variety of nodes, um, but there was a dual socket node where there's this switch that connects all the, the nodes together. And on that switch, there was uh, an AMD CPU and an NVIDIA GPU. Okay. So, that's what these systems look like. Lots of nodes that are connected with these very fast switches. These, these nodes have lots of memory, lots of bandwidth, 
GPUs, CPUs, right? So how, do we do, how would we ever imagine using them? Um, well, we would imagine using them on things like this. Okay, these are high performance computing things that are at the forefront of science. Uh, things like computational cosmology or quantum chemistry um, where you, we, there's no way we are going to ever get these things done uh, without putting a lot of intellectual effort and mapping them into a very big piece of computing hardware like uh, the Frontier supercomputer. Okay, So lots of humans working heavily at programming them to do these things that will advance science. Right? It's like building... Uh, you know, the Large Hadron Super Collider. That's the equivalent of it. Except we're doing more than just, you know, understanding the inner workings of, uh, of matter. We're looking at all sorts of things. Climate, weather, uh, social systems, economics. It's an incredible tool. The question is, how do we program these things? Like if you were working on any one of these projects and you had to write code, how would you write that code? One very common way, maybe the most popular way, is to use this thing called MPI. And trust me, MPI, I'm going to show you a few things and if you've ever done any network programming, you're going to say, oh, that's pretty obvious. That's, that seems very sensible. Uh, but it kind of evolved here over many, many, many years. Okay, it's been around for a very long time. And today, if you've ever done things like cloud programming, you know, client-server, remote procedure calls between REST APIs or microservices in the cloud, all these elements start to blend together, and MPI just looks like, well, it's just yet another one of these things. Okay. But the idea is I've got a bunch of these nodes, and within these nodes, I've got CPUs and GPUs. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, each of these nodes is running one of these big threads. Remember, at the beginning of the lecture, uh, we wanted to make a distinction between a big thread or CPU thread and a GPU thread. Running on the nodes is the CPU thread. I.O., interrupts, virtualization, exceptions, all this stuff, recursion, all the code we ever want to write, each of these nodes can execute without limitation. But within a node, hey, I've got these GPUs, and I want to make sure I can utilize them. Okay, so the MPI part is going to coordinate across the nodes. Whereas the CUDA part, we're not going to abandon CUDA, will work within the node. Okay, that's kind of the idea we're going to use here. So let's take a look at this MPI thing. What does it provide us? Again, Remember, we've got the CPU thread, the big unrestricted thread, or set of threads. And what we'll put within that unrestricted set of threads is the, the MPI message. By the way, MPI stands for Message Passing Interface because it's really about the communication between these things. And well, what, it, what we can do is um, we can set up these ranks, these groups, whereby we can exchange messages within these ranks. Okay, so there are some API calls to let us set up, if I've got, what did I have on the other side of the slide? 4,000 nodes, 4,000 CPUs. I can pick subsets of them off and say, okay, here's my rank and I'm gonna communicate within that rank. So let us take a look at an example. Okay, we're 
going to do, using a PI, vector addition. Okay, and here's what I want to say. We have the entire frontier supercomputer at our disposal, and we're going to do a vector addition. Okay, so how do I do that vector addition? Well, we're going to use MPI to take the vector addition and split it across the frontier supercomputer. But within each node, I've got some AMD GPUs. Let's flip them over to NVIDIA GPUs so we can use CUDA. And I'm going to use CUDA to accelerate the individual pieces of the vector addition on each node. Right, so first let's set things up. Okay, this is not that interesting. It's kind of like I got to set up, initialize MPI, set up the rank, and Dot, dot, dot. That's not really, let's not worry about these details, okay? Here's where it gets interesting. What I'm going to do is essentially have a main thread zero. That's going to take my whole vectors, A and B, and send them off to these nodes using MPI. So we're going to use this communication API called MPI send that takes a buffer, a count of data items, the data type, the destination identifier, and sends it off. So I've got 4,000 nodes. Node zero says, okay, I'm in charge. Node one, node two, node three, node four, and sends, using MPI send, the work to each of these nodes. That's really it. That's, that's how MBI send works. So I've got the starting address of the buffer. I've got a count of the number of elements in the buffer. So if I've got, you know, A has a billion elements, B has a billion elements, um, I'm not sending all billion to each node. So I'm going to send, let's say, 100, 100 million to each node. So count will be 100 million. And then data type, 32-bit float. Hey, let's pause a second. Count data type. That's a little different than CUDA mem copy. Right? How do I do it in CUDA mem copy? Number of bytes. This is count data type. Why that? I mean, they accomplish the same thing, right? Yes? But why do you think one is different than the other? This must be this way. Whereas for CUDA, I, I want to transfer A to the device. Here is the starting point of A. This is number of bytes. Just transfer it. Here, what we're saying is, I need to know the type, floating point, single precision, and the number of those. Why would, it, why would we need one versus the other? Really important thing here, by the way. Yeah. Bingo. Right? Remember, I, I could be using IBM systems. I could be using Intel systems, AMD systems. It turns out IBM systems are the opposite NDNs of x86. Um, because NDNs, it could be anything. I'm just going to explicitly tell you what you're getting. And you flip it around if you need to accommodate what you need, receiver. But me as the sender, this is what I'm sending. Very good. Okay. So that's how send works. It's just essentially going to send from one node to another some data. It's a message. I mean, at this point, you guys should be very familiar with message send APIs, right? You see them in so many different types of contexts. Now, 
With MPI, you need an explicit receive. The receiver doesn't receive the message until the receiver explicitly receives the message through a receive call. Okay. Um, so the receiver has to be expecting what the sender is sending. So there we go. And you see the corresponding things there. All right. So if that's the case, let's go back to our vector addition. Let's take a look at how we might do this. Okay, so if this is the server, this is again node zero. <clears throat> what we're going to do is um, just kind of allocate the local buffers, <laughs> A, B output, and initialize them, right? This is just very simple initialization code. Then, here's where it gets interesting. So now what we'll do is we'll go through all the nodes and we'll send. Node one, node two, node three. We'll get some chunk of A and get some chunk of B. Okay, very straightforward. And then once we're done with that, the server waits. There's a barrier. Again, some kind of the bulk synchronous model. I send all the work out, and then I wait. I wait for everybody to be done. That's what that MPI barrier does. And then once we're done, I collect up the results. And then we're done. We have just used the Frontier supercomputer at least to send data out and wait for the results. So now let's take a look at the compute side of it. Okay, on the compute side, well, I've got to do some initialization that's very analogous. I have to create A, I have to create B, I have to create a buffer for the output. Then I receive A, I receive B, and then I do the vector add. Interestingly, I could also insert a kernel right there. So I could have done that using a CUDA kernel. I know vector add seems a bit trivial, but you can imagine something more complex here. And then I enter the barrier, right? Because I'm waiting for all the threads to finish. And then once the threads, all the threads are finished, I send my output results back to the server and then done. Okay, so there we go. Crash course in uh, OpenMPI uh, 101. Any questions on this? Yeah. No, no, OpenMPI is very sophisticated and robust. Uh, I don't know it well enough to answer your question with, but here's the API to do that, but I would imagine yes, right? Because you don't want a uh, compute that's been running for 10 days to crash on you, right? That would be pretty lousy. Uh, the tag parameter, let's see. Yeah, what does the tag do? I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how people use the tag. Maybe it's some kind of message you can send to the receiver or from the receiver to the, yeah, from the sender to the receiver. Yeah. Well, they are.
are asynchronous, right? So these nodes, I mean, they could be across the world. They don't have to be within the same supercomputer, right? They can be anywhere. I mean, even within a node, right? All of this stuff is running asynchronously. Well, not really. Um, yeah, in fact, it is. It's running asynchronously, right? The GPUs and the CPU don't have the same clock. Good. Well, any other questions? Again, you know, don't dwell on the details. The idea here was just to give you a big sampling of how we uh, program in this brave new world of uh, accelerated computing. Okay, reminder, don't come to class on Thursday, but do join in if you're able uh, to the Zoom meeting with Ben. Okay, thank you.
Testing, testing, testing. Hello, hello.